So what is the fastest growing uh, sector of solid waste in the entire world? Think about it. What is it? Fastest growing sector of solid waste. It's actually electronic waste. So electronic waste is growing at a pace that we cannot possibly continue to, uh, to be able to handle in the ways that we're doing it now. Think about it. You've got iPhones, some of you in this room, I'm sure. Think about the person you know who's that iPhone fanatic. There's a good chance that in the last five years, they've actually had six different cell phones. Six different cell phones. But that wasn't enough for them in a lot of cases, right? Because you can't really read your emails on your iPhone. So you have to go out and get that iPad. But then there was the iPad 2 and recently the iPad 3, right? But, you know, you still need your laptop, right? Because you can't really do real work on your iPad. So for your real work, you have to have, an, uh, you have, to have a laptop. So in the last five years, some of you may have had two. Some of the people I know have had three different laptops, right? So that's it, right? Well, we've got a six in the audience. So you've had all these different laptops. So that's it, right? No, 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 no. Well, when you're doing your real, real, real work, nine to five and sitting in an office, you can't really do that on a laptop, can you? No, so for that, you gotta go get a desktop computer. And even that becomes obsolete after a couple of years. So is that it? Is, does, that, does that basically get you all the electronics that you need? Nope. You gotta have that fancy TV at home too, right? That big plasma screen, LCD, LED, whatever you got. But as soon as you go to Best Buy and you buy that brand new uh, LCD television, what happens just as you're walking out? See that sign that says 3D TV coming soon. And the 3D TV that you get is outdated before you even take that thing out of the store because the new 3D TVs don't even need glasses anymore, right? So you're constantly upgrading this stuff. And that's not even enough because your iPhone that wasn't big enough to read your emails it's actually too big when you're working out, right? So now you've got to go get that iPod Nano. Right? You've got to have that thing, because that thing is strapped right on your arm, go in your pocket, right? I mean, it's never enough. Now, I'm not telling you this to convince you not to uh, invest in uh, expensive gadgets and electronics. If they make your lives easier, I think that's a, that's a great thing. But I just want to give you some of the information um, about what happens to this stuff. So let's look at some things. For example, 20 to 50 million tons, that's tons, of electronic waste are produced globally every single year. All right. In the United States, only 19% of that was recycled, according to the EPA, in the, in, in the year 2010. Think about that. Only 19% was recycled. So the rest of my presentation is going to be spent talking to you about the other 81%, because that's the part I care about. The EPA also said that 2008, 2009, total waste in the United States actually decreased. So what was the only sector that increased? Electronics, right? The average lifespan of a PC is three to four years across the country. I don't know about you, but in my household, it's more like 12 to 18 months. In the US, we discard 500,000 mobile devices every single day. I don't know if you caught that day there. It's not year, every day, 500,000 devices are being discarded, right? So where does this all go? Well, I'll tell you where it goes. It goes into neighborhoods, it goes into rivers, it goes into landfills, it goes into uh, parks, it goes into streets and roads, right? I mean, don't you see it all? When you guys leave from here on your way home, don't you see e-waste piled up in your rivers? Don't you see e-waste piled up in your parks? Don't you see it on your streets when you're going home? Don't you see little kids burning electronics so that they get, can get precious metals out of them, right? Wait, I'm not getting too many yeses. <laughs> Interesting. That's right, because you don't live in a developing nation. You don't live in the parts of the world that we dump our waste on, right? You don't live in a place like this. You don't live in a place like this where your old iPhones, your old iPads, your old computers, televisions, monitors, you name it, where your old junk ends up. This is the kind of place that it ends up in. And yes, I'm talking about your e-waste, because remember, 81% of our e-waste is not recycled responsibly in the United States. So guess where it goes? It goes overseas gets dumped into places like this, and this is what they do with it. They burn them, they burn it, because this is the way that they can get money out of it. We've been talking about food and water. We hear some people um, that I'm gonna tell you more about who used to do things like have rice fields and things like that. And then our e-waste came along. And now what they're doing is they're destroying their lives, they're destroying their health, and what they're doing is they're burning this e-waste so they can get little bits of precious metals out of it. Einstein said, we shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. We really do need to think about it, a new way of doing this. So in 1989, 
long time ago, right? The United Nations had a treaty at the Basel Convention. And what it was supposed to do is it was supposed to stop the dumping of hazardous waste from developing nations to, I'm sorry, from developed nations to developing nations. Sounds like a pretty simple thing. You're a developed nation, you've got all this fancy stuff, you've got computers and you know, nuclear power plants and all this stuff. Don't dump your waste on a developing nation. Seems very simple to me. Well, unfortunately, it didn't get the, they didn't get the leverage it needed, so it didn't have the teeth that it, it should have had. So in 1995, there was an, an amendment to it, pushed along uh, in large part by the European Union. And this amendment was finally gonna put teeth on this thing. Interestingly enough, as of 2012, the United States is the only country that participated in that original Basel Convention that not only has not uh, accepted the amendment, we haven't even ratified the original treaty from 1989. Think about that for a minute. So why is it that we're doing this? It's economics, right? It's always about money. It's always going to come down to money. And in this case, no doubt, one million cell phones Remember, 500,000 discarded every day in the US alone. So if you take a million cell phones and you recycle it, you get 50 pounds of gold. I see some of the girls in the room, their eyes are lighting up. <laughs> 550 pounds of silver, 20 pounds of palladium, and 20,000 pounds of copper. This is very valuable stuff. I mean, usually when you measure gold, you measure in ounces. We're talking pounds of gold, right? This is what's coming out of these electronics. And cell phones have more than other electronics, but everything, all kinds of electronics have these uh, valuable uh, metals in them. So, but here's the other side. They also have these hazardous contents. They also have lead, mercury, cadmium, lead tin solder, dioxins, brominated flame retardants, heavy metals. All this stuff is contained within these electronics, right? So it just depends where this stuff goes for processing. It depends if it goes to a place where it's gonna be recycled responsibly, or if it goes to a place where it's just gonna be dumped into landfills and rivers and, 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 and streets and God knows where else. So if it's recycled responsibly, in the United States there are many companies that do it responsibly. I happen to be, be uh, the, the president of one of those companies, but there are plenty of other ones. And what we do is we take the stuff you saw on the previous slide, the gold, the silver, the palladium and all that stuff, and that's what funds our business. But then we're left with this stuff. What do we do with it? Well. We, re we recycle it responsibly, but it costs us money to recycle it responsibly. It would be very easy to just take this stuff and dump it in a river, right? Getting rid of our leaded glass is very costly, but we have no choice because we're in this business because we're trying to make a difference. And for me personally, um, I was a, uh, a kid that made some bad choices uh, when I was in high school. I used to get straight Fs and I decided enough is enough. I dropped out, decided to start my own computer company in the mid 90s. I did that for a few years and I became somewhat of a computer geek, which helps me today dealing with these computers. But a few years into it, I realized it was a stupid decision. I went back to school, went to a community college, got a 4.0, transferred into University of California, Berkeley, the world capital for tree huggers. Um, and I became somewhat of a tree hugger there. Later on, I went on to medical school, didn't finish, um, but I came out of medical school and I was looking for something to do. And I saw a special on 60 Minutes about this topic right here, back in 2008. When I saw this special, it really touched my heart. And at the same time, I realized I had the unique set of skills that maybe I could do something about this. So I combined my knowledge as a computer geek with my, my passion for the environment as a tree hugger from Berkeley. I put those two together and I was able to create this company, All Green Electronics Recycling. But it's amazing that every day that I'm in this business, I realize how much, how tough it is to make something happen if the economics aren't in your favor. And every day we come to this realization because today, right here in the city that we live in and in this county, we can't get city contracts. We can't get county contracts. We can't get the school districts down the street from our house to recycle with us. You know why? Because we're not the highest bidder <laughs> and we never will be because the people who can dump this stuff into rivers will always make a higher bid than we were. We will. So there is a choice. That just happens to be a picture of our building. You could substitute any responsible recycler in there. You can make a choice. It either goes there or it can go here. It's our choice. You can decide whether electronics are recycled like this in a controlled environment with health and safety standards or like up there. It's our choice. We get to choose. You can decide if we use forklifts like these or if we use shopping carts like this to move this stuff around. 
You can make a choice if this is the world that we want to create where little kids are taking apart our old cell phones. And if you look closely in there, there's a couple of iPods in there actually. The wire up there, the fire, you see all this. This is the reality of what's happening to your old electronics when you decide you're done with them. But we do have a choice. As I keep saying, we have a choice. And it's a pretty simple choice. We have to choose to recycle responsibly. So unlike your bottles and cans that you can just put in a recycle bin, electronics are just not that way, unfortunately. You can't just put them in a recycling bin. But there are a lot of good people in this room and people watching this online, and maybe you're a tree hugger like me, but maybe you're not. And you say, you know what? Screw the planet. I hate the planet. I don't care about the planet. Well, guess what? I got a sales pitch for you too, <laughs> right? Even if you hate the planet and you don't give a darn about what happens and you don't care about these kids, guess what? You see all those electronics there? They've got your data on them. They've got your phone numbers, your bank account numbers, your health, health records from the hospitals. All that information is on this stuff. And guess what happens to it? You think they have data destruction policies in, in parts of uh, the developing nations where this stuff is being, being recycled? And if they're willing to burn this stuff and, and, and put their own health at risk to get little precious metals off of there, what do you think they would do with your data if, if it could be sold? You think everyone in the world is good and they're gonna say, oh no, we're not gonna go through that stuff? No, unfortunately, there are major, major data security concerns. And it's not just on your computers and laptops, because I know that's what you're all thinking. Oh yeah, my computer, my laptop has a lot of valuable data. It's also on your cell phones. Have you thought about it? Your cell phone probably has more valuable data on it these days, or more private data than sometimes your computer at home. Because a lot of us now are storing our passwords and important bank account records and ATM pin codes and security alarm codes and things like that on our cell phones. And it doesn't even stop there. Copy machines. Think about copy machines. Your copy machines these days have a tremendous amount of data on them. I bet you didn't know most copy machines have a hard drive inside. How else do you think you can scan a 50-page document? Or do you think it just stores that somewhere in the wires? No, there's a hard drive on there. And most people don't know this. So that data stays. And even when you decide you're going to delete the, the, the drive, you're going to format the drive, the data is still not gone. The data is still there. And that data, even though you think you, you deleted it, it's not gone. And if you don't believe me, think about this. T take the last time you say that you downloaded 50 pictures from your camera onto your uh, laptop. If you take, download 50 pictures, maybe it takes 10 minutes. Now delete those pictures and see how long it takes. A second. Two seconds at most. Why is that? It's because your computer is lying to you. Your computer tells you I'm deleting them, but it's not really deleting them. It's just hiding them from you. Hides them from you, but it can't hide them from criminals out there who are trying to get that data when you dump it. So regardless of whether you're a tree hugger like me or you uh, just want to protect your data, I hope I've convinced you that we've got to do the right thing. So what's being done about it? Because there are some really great things being done about it. Right now, for example, there's some third-party certifications that recycling companies can go through. One is called eStewards by the Basel Action Network. There's another one, R2 Responsible Recycling. ISO 14001, and then the National Association of Information, uh, for Information Destruction, NAID, also has certifications available. And in fact, E. Stewart's has recently done something very unique where they've taken these other two and they've encompassed them within that particular certification. So my company, which just went through E. Stewart's certification, we now are a part of R2 and ISO 14001 as well. And we're in the process of going through NAID certification for data destruction. So these certifications are out there and the third party certifications so you can confirm that the company you're doing business with has these things. But here's the tough part. The good guys and the bad guys in this business, they, they don't look that different. You might donate your stuff to a charity. You might donate your old electronics to a, to a thrift store and you might think you're doing the right thing. But guess what they do with it? They're not educated about this either, unfortunately. They just give it to the highest bidder. People come by on Saturday mornings, so a lot of these thrift shops and nonprofits, and they, they buy this stuff by the, by the cart full or by the truck full. And guess where it ends up? Certainly doesn't come to my company, I can assure you that. Certainly doesn't go to our competitors who are recycling responsibly. It ends up going overseas and gets dumped, and you saw some of the pictures of what happens to it. So you have to make that choice. Jim Puckett, uh, the head of the Basel Action Network, says, wherever we lived, we must realize that when we sweep things out of our lives and throw them away, they don't ever disappear as we might like to believe. We must know that a way is in fact a place. In a world where cost externalization is made all too easy by the pathways of globalization, a way is likely to be somewhere where people are impoverished, disenfranchised, powerless, and too desperate to be able to resist the poisons for the realities of their poverty. 
A way is likely to be a place where people and environments will suffer from our carelessness, our ignorance, and our indifference. So you look at this boy who uh, is working in one of these fields, recycling electronics, if, if you can call it recycling, um, and you have a choice to make. The next time you, your company, your school district, the hospital, the bank that you work at or work with, if they're getting rid of their old electronics, there's a choice to be made. What's gonna happen with it? And there's the one choice. We're gonna get every damn cent we can out of, can out of it. And that's a choice. You see this boy is, is an example of that choice. But then there's another choice, and that choice is to do something responsible, make sure that those electronics don't go overseas for processing, and it's just a matter of thinking about it and making the right choices. And it's, all it is, is, is just doing a little bit of research, a little bit of homework to find out what the right way to dispose in your area is. So this is gonna be heard, hopefully, around the world. And if you're listening to this anywhere in the world, I can't help you if you live in 99% in, in of the world. So if that's the case, you've got to go online, you've got to do your research, and you want to make sure that you recycle your electronics in a manner that ensures they're not going to end up in, uh, in landfills and in, in, in people's homes and uh, hurting these kids. So there's a Native American proverb that uh, says, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. I've known of this for a while. Uh, someone just showed it to me again. And this, this saying used to mean something to me, but not really that much until about 12, uh, well, 14 months ago now when I had my first little girl. Now I've got another baby on the way. And so when I see this, it really touches me in a way that uh, it's never touched me before. But as, as I stand in front of you, we all have a choice. And the choice is, are we going to uh, leave the planet in a way that our, our kids are going to uh, be able to enjoy it the way that we did? Thank you.